Okay, so I think that's most people joined now. So we'll just maybe get make a start because it's quite a lot of cover this evening. Um, we are again funded by the University Innovation Fund for the lamb crop series. And this unbelievably is the last one of the series. We've had four fantastic webinars, starting with finishing the tail end lambs. Then we looked at managing triplets. Last week, we looked at um, reducing input on the grassland side. And tonight we have got Daniel and Joe to speak to us about reducing input, looking at the labour side. So there's loads and loads of um, different components come in to, to the reducing labour. So we are actually going to start this evening with Daniel Stout. He is going to set the scene and um, give us loads and loads of figures of uh, labour and uh, give us some thought-provoking um, information. So I'm sure many of you <laughs> will have um, <laughs> seen and uh, heard Daniel in the past. Daniel is a sheep and grass and consultant with SAC Consulting, and he is based down in Stirling. So Daniel, do you want to bring your screen up and you can introduce the topic of reducing input through labour? Um, as as we go through the presentations, folks, please use the Q and A function and chat if you want to ask any questions or raise anything. Um, over to yourself, Daniel. Perfect. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, evening, everyone, uh, for this lamb crop webinar. Again, looking at reducing flock labour in relation uh, reducing flock labour in relation to inputs. Uh, I think through Michael Blanche's Time podcast. Over the last year, it's actually stimulated quite a lot more discussion with the industry about time, about labour efficiency, uh, about work-life balance, or often probably the lack of. Uh, my aim tonight was to try and pull together some figures, this being the UIF uh, project, uh, looking at labour use in sheep systems, kind of taking a measure to manage approach uh, through reviewing the available research, looking at the English farm business survey data, stock take data, and research by my colleague, Claire Morgan Days of, of SRUC, uh, to identify opportunities potentially where we can refine our labour uh, demands. First off, uh, looking at analysis of labour usage from the farm business survey data. This is four years of data uh, by Paul Wilson. What we can see here, and I think it's quite interesting to try and put an, an hours per U that, we, 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 that it takes to manage these use throughout the year. What we can see is that the most efficient, and this is the best in terms of labour efficiency, of flocks in lowland and LFA use spend about two hours per U per annum, whilst the average sits around double that, at around four to five hours per U, and with the worst, uh, in, most inefficient flocks, spending five times more than the most efficient flocks in terms of labour. Now, if we think about that labour in pounds an hour, so we put a wage on that, say we say it's 15, 20 pound an hour, we're getting to some pretty big labour costs in some of those more inefficient flocks. We also see very clearly, this is the same data overlapped with uh, the number of ewes in those flocks on average in those quartiles. We can see a very, very clear uh, benefit of economic economics of scale, where the best flocks in the lowland flocks are sitting about 500 ewes, compared to those uh, of those worst labour efficient flocks sitting at 130 ewes. Likewise, in the LFA flocks, which are inherently bigger, these are more hill units, we can see that the best flocks sit at 850 which is considerably more than the average flock or the worst uh, flock for efficiency. I suppose this isn't surprising considering that it doesn't take too much more time to check or lamb or feed 500 ewes rather than 400 ewes. There's absolutely economies of scale here. But of course, within a given flock size, we know that there's also significant variation uh, in labor. Uh, requirements, why does it matter? Why does it matter that some flocks take five times more hours per ewe uh, than others. And ultimately, it comes down to two things, our ability to run more use per labour unit and our ability to invest less time in a given flock size. And ultimately, I think the big thing there is it comes back down to economic viability, our ability to get a better return from paid labour. So reducing our labour costs per U, which is a, actually probably the most significant cost they've properly costed out. Um, and in reverse, if we are a flock owner and operator, then to pay ourselves a more realistic wage. So to make a better hourly rate in terms of the profit generated across the time that we input. Ultimately as well, this allows us to facilitate scaling up if we can manage more use per labor unit. And also perhaps more in a given flock size, we can try and improve our work-life balance 
Also, our emotional well-being, a big part of that is that tied to the work-life balance, but also potentially reducing mundane tasks and also encouraging the next generation to join the business. I think it's often said that young people don't want to farm or they're not interested, don't want to work. But I think often that's actually the farming system that's not attractive to them, particularly if you think about working sheep on a Sunday. So I think through having lower labour, lower intervention, easier managed flocks, maybe with some technology involved, we can make that more attractive for, for the younger generation. Uh, considering economic viability and taking that against that stock take data, if we consider paying uh, someone minimum wage to look after our sheep, we can see that we really need to be at that two hours per you if we're going to have a hope or a chance of making a profit from that flock. We really need to be at that 20, 30 pound a you uh, sort of price. If we then overlap that again and we consider maybe paying a shepherd, we consider that at two hours a you, that's sitting at about a thousand ewes per labour unit. Whereas if we were at that bottom third, which I don't think it'll exist in a paid flock, perhaps at that number, we're sitting at about 260 for one full-time equivalent. If we then consider what that costs per ewe against the shepherd's wage of say 33, but of course with a significant variation there, including some bonus payments and things like that, we need to consider that we probably need to be realistically up at that a thousand ewes per labour unit if we're going to make a return on having a shepherd to run our ewes and have profit margin at the end. Um, of course, even in inefficient systems, we can run more use by simply just working more hours and working weekends. But um, it's surely more efficient uh, or better to work harder, sorry, work smarter and not harder and, and, and try and run more use on less hours per you. Many of us won't pay a shepherd. Many of us will run our own use and often won't really value our time. But I thought it was interesting to try and look at where we probably need to be if we want to make a good margin off use without subsidy going forward. And this is taking the QMS net margin, less labour data from the 2021 lamb crop and looking at if I can run two ewes uh, two per uh, two hours per ewe, I can run a thousand ewes. What is the net margin profitability that I can make uh, excluding labour? And what we can see here is that we really need to be in that top third of profitability, making in that year a very significant net margin of £64 a ewe and potentially at least within that top end of, of, of labour performance profitability as well. But actually, if we then consider that the previous year's net margins for sheep were in fact 50% that of 2021, we realise that probably going forward as an industry, we probably need to be in that focusing on that top third without subsidy payments and also looking at around 1,000 plus use per labour unit. So we really do need to think about that labour efficiency going forward. How do we get there? Just some thoughts. I think the key to the whole thing will be that labour efficiency or work-life balance must actually be part of our key strategic thinking. So when we're making decisions, we're thinking about in the background, not just about output or profit, we're also thinking about what is the labour cost to that, and that impacts our, our, our hourly rate as well, ultimately, doesn't it? Um, and unless you make that priority, you may end up making antagonistic decisions for work-life work -life balance and often profit. If we just chase simple production traits, for example, pushing the number of fat lambs that we can produce, we might end up in a narrow focus, focus on, for example, confirmation and muscling, which might be to the detriment of things like lambing ease, system suitability. We might, we might push us towards an earlier lambing, maybe heavier feeding, all of which come with additional labour demand. Um, Intellistic management, uh, your decision making is checked against your context. So not only are you thinking about the economic, but you're always thinking about the social when you're making decisions. And I think that's important going forward if we want to get these improvements in work-life balance. Perhaps not chasing that last 20% of production if it's at the detriment of, for example, our weekends or a lower hourly rate, just chasing those little gains. We really need to think about developing a system which is aimed at low in labour intervention and having genetics that suit that, considering if our genetics are actually going to enable that or are they going to hinder that. Uh, we also need within that to look at whatever system we're running, look at labour efficiency through that in terms of infrastructure, technology, proactive management. And I think that's one that's difficult to be prescriptive, but it's about being timely. It's about getting on top of things like lameness, having on-point nutrition to prevent, having to firefight all the time, just doing the right things, not just doing the right things, but doing them at the right time. And of course, there's benefit in economies of scale that I don't think we can get away from. What does a low labour intervention system look like? I think ultimately uh, farming systems are based on providing the needs of the stock. 
Uh, but the number and intensity of intervention can vary massively depending on the system. And we need to look at systems that ultimately make the flock work for us rather than the other way around. So reducing the amount of intervention time that we need to give that flock. Uh, it would be my kind of personal perspective that most of the large scale flocks that I've worked with that have a focus on lower labor input will focus on simplicity. They're more than likely forage based focused systems and they have functional genetics. And it's worth saying that often these take more management input actually to make them work and refine them. And a big part of that is trying to make a system, I think, that's better suited to su matching supply and demand so that we're maximizing pasture in the diet. They're probably later lambing flocks. So flocks potentially looking at outdoor lambing where we can run a lot more ewes, often 600 plus 1,000 ewes with one labor unit compared to indoor lambing flocks. We're maybe looking at 250 ewes uh, per labor unit plus night cover. They also often would look at a tight lambing period, and that's not just about, say, using teasers or having a tight giving lambing period, but also having one lambing period, where you often see that flocks will try and spread different, have multiple lambing periods, perhaps a slightly earlier flock, perhaps hogs later, uh, in, the, in the aim of spreading the labour demand. Ultimately, what this does is it generates additional handling events and a, and a massive increase in total. For example, we'll have to do multiple vaccination periods if we've got lambs at different ages, for example. There'll be a big focus on genetics that suit the system, and also a focus more on days to slaughter, perhaps in carcass, and considering store sales as an option, and having that preventative uh, disease control. And this is reflected in some of the stock take data report, where it shows net margin profitability in 2016. This is the last year of stock take, unfortunately, which has good data for labour. Uh, it ranges significantly, and what we see is that's largely driven by that labour cost per year and properly costed. And where we see a difference again, the top performing flocks are using about two hours per U compared to the bottom third, and this time it's in profitability, are sitting at four hours per U. So a significant difference. And this is again reflected in flock size, but it's also reflected in the system that they're running, where we see that the most profitable flocks actually didn't have any more output. They were solely focused on generating lower labor input systems and having lower input systems based on uh, forage and reduced variable costs in terms of concentrate. And part of an interesting KPI that they had in there was uh, full grazing weeks without feed, where we can see that those flocks had three more weeks where they weren't giving a feeding intervention and a labor requirement there. Uh, moving on to data uh, from Claire Morgan Davies. Uh, I think there's some really interesting stuff in here. Uh, what we can see here is the first one, uh, optimizing use of labor at lambing time done through HDB. Uh, along with Chawton Park Farms, Ian Robertson, uh, where they looked at what was the labour demand throughout an outdoor lambing system uh, on three flocks. Uh, all who did record at birth of lambs, they had over a thousand ewes, so good commercial flocks, and were all seen to be doing best practice. So they're all good, efficient flocks. And they put the shepherds, they had GoPros on them for an average of, I remember right, about eight hours a day. And they reviewed what the shepherds were doing through uh, looking back on that footage. It must have been a pretty pretty dull uh, bit of research for those for those counting those uh, tasks on the GoPro. What they can see here then, so this is the mid lambing point. So this is at the heat of lambing when things are really going. What they found is that those shepherds were spending about 23% of their time driving. So just simply driving between different parks to check stock. They found that about 27% of time was spent with lambs and about 17% was used and a variety of other tasks filled in the rest. Um, it sat at about for some of those flocks between one and a half to two hours simply just driving. 40 minutes and uh, 40 minutes spent tagging, tailing and castrating lambs with a lot of time moving stock, mothering up, transporting. And for most flocks, about 20 minutes a day actually spent catching ewes to lamb. So I think we can see that that would be different in flocks perhaps that had less appropriate genetics, but these were flocks that had genetics that suited the system. What they noted here actually was that the shepherds were very surprised by the sheer amount of driving that they were doing. Um, and um, from that, that kind of put a focus for them on trying to identify perhaps where they could reduce that amount of driving. Um, they considered where their lambing fields were and how they can maybe move between them in a more efficient way. And one thing that came out of the study was the use of the Endomondo app where you can uh, track your movements. I think you could do that on several apps now on your mobile phone. Uh, to look at your routes and they actually found it quite useful and they did gain insight from visualizing those routes that they were taking and trying to identify 
where was perhaps the unnecessary route that they were taking or where they could cut out fields or where they could potentially better place gates to make it a more efficient uh, loop around. When they then looked at that, so that was at peak lambing. This is now the, the results for the duration of lambing. Of course, things slowed down a bit. They found that they went from 19 hours uh, for a thousand ewes per day. Um, so I guess it's kind of like almost what, somewhere around one and a half to two labor units per thousand ewes that they were lambing at. Some of these are quite big flocks, uh, down to about 14 hours per day later on uh, in the season as things started to you know, wrap down a little bit. But they did see that a lot more time was then committed uh, to, to aftercare and other, other activities. And actually what they found here was even more stark in terms of that time spent driving, walking and opening gates. And actually they highlight that 21% of the time overall was spent simply opening gates, which seems like a, a big, drain on, big drain on resources. And that from that, from the study and the kind of realization, two of the farms then implemented things that they could see that would reduce that burden. Uh, one of them was farm two, uh, purchased ATV or quad ramps so that they didn't have to open gates, they could simply slide over. So a really good example of how infrastructure can help you there. And farm three, probably slightly more novel, uh, is considering looking at temporary cattle gates that they can put between fields to again, reduce that, that requirement. Uh, in terms of lambing fields, so this is what we can see here is that when they looked at the different, the three different farms, blue, green, and yellow, they could see that different farms spent significantly amount, amounts of time different in how they use their time in terms of some farms are driving a lot more, some farms proportionately spent more time with ewes um, or opening gates, for example. So it, it kind of highlighted different things for different farms. For example, farm one had different locations up to four miles away. So they were inherently going to have to spend more time driving, which they maybe can't get away from. When they looked at U tasks, what they could see here, uh, this is probably even more stark, because that's the different tasks that are spent on the different uh, on the different U tasks. What we can see is some bars hardly even register for some farms, where some farms, for example, farm blue, so the blue farm there, farm one, uh, was drift lambing, whilst farm two uh, lambed U's and moved them after a few days. Drift lambing being when you move the ewes, uh, the unlambed ewes on and leave the ewes with lambs in the next field. Whilst farm three in yellow had a slightly more interesting system <laughs> where they, they lambed outdoors, moved the ewe and lambs to individual pens for 12 hours, and then actually moved them inside for 12 hours. And we could probably see a labour inefficiency in that system. And we can really see that here uh, for farm yellow in the amount of time they spend actually moving ewes. So there's like they've made they've created quite a significant labor burden there in terms of having to move stock. It was also noted that farm one, uh, which actually had four thousand ewes in the study, put a lot of investment in terms of electric fencing pre-lambing to fence off ditches, to fence off problem areas, and to make it easier to catch ewes during lambing. When they looked at the lamb task uh, factors. What we could then see again was a significant difference in the amount of time that flocks spent doing different tasks. Again, farm three, which moved stock, ended up spending up to th well, sort of 33% of the time of lamb tasks just mothering up lambs because they've had so many different movement periods and they've had to spend time mothering those lambs up to the next point. It was noted that all farms tagged lambs, but actually it was only farm three that EID recorded. And whilst the other farms did, you know, they did record mother to dam, they were doing that on paper. And you could see that EID recording would improve that efficiency, but it had in this case sort of stimulated a more intensive system of penning. Um, it was noted that farm two had gotten away from having to catch use or be close to use for EID recording by using flag tags. So they could just write the number down, but they could benefit with using ID, EID recorder there as well. And that farm spent a lot more time um, tailing and castrating the others, but I guess this comes down to a proportionate thing as well. And it was noted that a lot of this lie, a lot of the inefficiency here lied sometimes in the order of tasks that the bit the businesses or the shepherds chose to do and whether that increased the amount of intervention times that they had to had to carry out. Uh, I'll then move on to uh, our second last study uh, again with Claire Morgan Davies, uh, this time looking at an indoor lambing system. This was just part of a larger project. Um, where they looked at medium to high versus high prolificacy use. So this was Irish study, 
uh, looking at 170 to versus 150% lamin. And in Norway, uh, <laughs> hyperlificacy was 220% rearing versus 190% rearing. So still incredibly high rearing flocks. And they did find a, a significant uh, profit benefit in the higher ones with actually it not statistically different labor demand overall for these flocks. But it was interesting, I thought, just on this slide here, to look at how the different tasks were allocated through lambing in comparison uh, to um, outdoor lambing systems. And what they found within indoor lambing systems is that they actually spend about 50% of the time spent on the ewes and the lambs, so much more, much more hands-on intervention. But actually, when we compare that to the outdoor lambing flock, they don't spend 33% of their time uh, just simply driving. So it's a different way of allocating your time, I suppose. Uh, further breakdown as well into this showed that a third of time was spent simply checking stock. 18% of the time was spent feeding lambs. So there's a significant demand in, in nursing lambs, in, in carry lambs and pet lambs. Um, and also, uh, particularly in the high uh, prolificacy one, 21% of time was actually spent preparing milk uh, for these lambs. So we can see significant opportunities maybe to improve our, our efficiencies here. Uh, and some examples might be the use of cameras to reduce the amount of time checking stock. Uh, a key wing would be how you plan out your, your fields, uh, sorry, your fields, uh, the shed design in terms of having triplets conveniently uh, placed next to singles or having pet pens uh, next, to your trip, uh, to next to your single pens. Uh, to you know to, to easily access lambs to foster on, uh, being prepared with sufficient tools and drugs etc., and also having several copies of each equipment or drug within different sheds, um, so that this equipment can be washed and disinfected whilst other in use. So you've got efficient, you've always got stuff to hand. Uh, you've got sufficient pens uh, for the number of use you've got, so you're not kind of making uh, ad hoc pens. Uh, having baby bottle warmers, and in particular, when we think back to that time spent feeding lambs investment again to save time uh, in terms of automatic feeders. Uh, another suggestion might be putting water pipes in to look to reduce the amount of manual watering you're doing in terms of putting buckets out. Um, as we consider that you can drink up to eight liters a day, you can do a lot of bucket filling. And also concepts such as uh, improving your communication in terms of having lambing pen boards so that each member of staff when they come, can see what's happened to those. You've not got that efficiency of not knowing what to do and, and double checking lambs. And finally, just cautious of the time, uh, Kirsten's probably looking at me now, uh, was the utilization or the opportunity in terms of utilizing technology in regard to reducing labor. Uh, so this was a study over several years. It's published in 2018, uh, and it's based on our Kurt and Nochtatire research farm. Um, up at Cree and Larrick, where they looked at the difference between in their system performance recorded use, but managed on two systems. Conventionally, uh, where ewes are manually drafted and um, ESEID recording is used, but they are manually drafted, or what's called the PLF option, which is where they used a Prattly five way auto drafter. And they also did additional management there in terms of not just shedding quickly, but also uh, basing feed levels or, or drafting for body condition score, but using weight loss which is quite novel, uh, and looking at the TST approach for warming based on, on weight gains for lambs. Uh, what they found is the use of the auto drafter reduced labour by 36% and also gave a £3 per U ne positive net margin benefit, largely down to labour saving. So if we consider our labour costs properly, our time or the labour that we have to take in, you can see that there's significant benefits here. They also reduced warming by 40%. On the 1200 use that reduced handling time, that's only handling time, this isn't other man farm management practices, it's just the handling of stock from 43 days to 26 days or 0.3 to 0.2 hours per U on that 1200 hill U type use. They also noted that a lot of flocks don't performance record. Uh, so when simplifying those systems and they did modeling on that, they found that the benefit to using the PLF probably sits more at 1.60 per U per annum uh, with a 19% labor saving. So still labor saving in more conventional flocks. And they ca calculated that for 900 U's at three pound a U in labor bit saving benefit, that actually you could get a payback on a 10K Prattly uh, in just under or just over four years. And then thereafter a potential labor saving benefit mostly of about 2,700.
Uh, final note I've got here, Northern Ireland research found 50% of handling facilities are inadequate, adding 1 to 1 1.5 hours per U per year. And in conclusion, I'll maybe just cut that bit out, but in conclusion, we can see significant variations in labour demands between different farms. And there's a real need to look at that going forward if we want to make viable uh, systems that give us a good work-life balance. Uh, considering labour efficiency and strategic decisions, developing a system that's aimed at lower intervention, having the right genetics and having the right uh, kind of uh, management practices within that are absolutely key. But I think my final recommendation to take home um, would be to listen to the It's About Time podcast series through Pasture Pod by Michael Blanche. Um, I think it's much less dry than stats about labour efficiency research. And there's some great learnings uh, from farmers that he interviews and also experts on topics such as lean management. I will stop there. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Daniel. A huge amount of information there. Very, really quite thought provoking, actually, isn't it? Um, and nice to see the kind of breakdown over the different lambing systems as well. Quite shocking that six percent of time is opening gates. Yeah, it's a lot of time, isn't it? It's um, it's amazing how it adds up. Absolutely amazing. Um, I think as well, it's it's a good time probably just to to pitch in and that we've got a webinar next Thursday night that's actually looking at the the data side. Um, along with labour as well and that's through our Opportunity North East project so we're going to have two speakers there and um, Dan Robertson from Titty Booty who's in Aberdeenshire who's really just at the start of his journey with um, kind of data management and understanding which data actually saves time and which data is creating him time. And then we'll hear from somebody who's a lot further down um, we'll hear from Owen Gray from Sockland and every decision they make on the farm is due to data so maybe just put the link for that um, into the chat there but that follows on quite nicely there from daniel joe would you like to bring your screen up please um following on there from daniel um highlighting labor and um, where efficiencies and inefficiencies are Joe is now going to speak to us on the genetic side and how, how genetics can aid here. And um, Joe is a, well, she is a sheep geneticist. She is, I would, I would say, the best person um, that, is, that can talk to us about this. So we're really, really um, lucky to have Joe along with us tonight. Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Kirsten. And thanks, da Daniel, for a good introduction to the subject. Um, I'm, I promise not to have quite so many numbers, but there will be one or two on the screen as we, as we go through. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, delivered uh, by other partners across uh, the globe, including our partners in, uh, in Ireland, uh, as we collaborated on a project called Smarter. So you'll see that logo going about uh, throughout, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the, the talk. But to, when we think about breeding approaches, there's several ways we can look at it. We can either um, select between different breeds, i.e. substitute one breed for another. We can select animals within a breed uh, using breeding values to identify superior rams and, and new replacements. Or we can use crossbreeding and whereby we, uh, we get the best of both worlds from two different breeds. But in this um, talk, I'm just going to concentrate on uh, selection within breeds. <clears throat> and if you can imagine your flock, if, you, if you've got a flock, um, and think about the ewes as individuals. I'm sure that you can think of individual animals that you've had to assist at lambing perhaps more than once, or you've had to deal with uh, dopey lambs, or ewes that don't want their lambs, or even ewes that prefer the field uh, next to the ones you're supposed to be in. All of these challenges add up particularly uh, at around lambing time to increase the demand for your time at the busiest uh, time of year. I'm sure you can also identify um, animals that um, g give you extra time needed to deal with a manifestation of endemic diseases such as foot rot, mastitis and worms. And as you'll know, some farmers use breeds and strains of sheep that shed their wool annually, not least to negate the time spent dealing with shearing itself, uh, dirty uh, back ends to avoid fly strike or clean up lambs for slaughter. So 
those are kind of elements of um, individual animal char characteristics uh, that uh, uh, use uh, your labor, as I'm sure you are aware. And our colleague in, um, in Ireland, Alan Bowen, um, similar to what uh, uh, Daniel has been talking, has plotted the uh, labor requirements and percentages across the, uh, the, the uh, reproductive year. And it will come as no surprise uh, that the, the effort that's needed around lambing time is, um, is around 20, more than 25%. Um, so it, improving individual animal traits that take up so much of our time is a logical step towards breeding sheep that require less labor input at around that lambing time. But how can we improve lamb survival whilst reducing labor input at lambing? And the, the, the genetic basis to lamb survival is typically really very low. Um, and um, that limits the progress that we can make if we're using breeding as a way to improve uh, lamb survival. However, the individual components of what contributes to lamb survival uh, do have higher heritability estimates, and therefore it's potentially easier or, or it's quicker to um, record elements such as lambing ease, mothering ability and lamb vigour within a, a breeding program. And that will enable um, you to pick rams whose daughters have easy lambings, plenty of milk, strong maternal behaviors and vigorous lambs that stand and suck quickly. And having tools in the toolbox for these um, sires would help to take the risk out of selecting the wrong sire uh, to breed your replacement females. And picking the, the, which ram to choose from, from these three beauties would be quite difficult unless you had uh, the breeding values to enable you to reduce the risk from selecting the wrong sire. So with lambing ease then, um, in Ireland, they have a, um, a four point score, which they use in their breeding program from uh, no lambing assistance to uh, four being the worst We're using veterinary assistance being required. And um, our colleagues, Noreen um, at Hugh has published a, a really nice paper and all the papers that I'm putting up in this talk are, uh, are open access. So if you're, if you're interested, you're, you're, you can just go along and, and read them. In the UK, we have very, very similar, um, although it's a six point score with three of the scores um, required for uh, veterinary assistance, <clears throat> surgical or, or non-surgical. Non and from the work that we, uh, a colleague of ours, um, Stephanie Matteson, way back in 2012 for her PhD, uh, working together with Kathy Lamb, looked at, Kathy Dwyer, sorry, um, looked at the genetic basis to some of these component parts of uh, at around the time of lambing. So the, uh, if you don't worry about all the numbers, but just look at the ones um, uh, on the diagonal and um, the heritability of these traits are what we call moderate. So 26% uh, is um, the estimate for uh, uh, needing assistance at birth, 39% for lamb vigor, and 31% for sucking assistance. So really moderate and much better than the overall uh, lamb uh, survival um, trait, which um, we've, we've has a relatively low heritability. And that's really useful for um, for, for breeding programs. And, and looking a little bit more deeply as to um, some, of, some of the things that impact on uh, time again, uh, you know, getting lambs to suck and uh, fiddling around with uh, holding lambs up to the teeth is really, really time consuming. And this graph shows the time to stand uh, and time to suck in, which is the, the minutes on the vertical axis. Um, and as shown by the far right bars, the uh, time for the animals that died at, a, at around the time of, of birth. So if you look at that far, the far right uh, two bars where the blue one is the time to stand. So that animals that died at around lambing time were, um, didn't start, didn't stand until over an hour after birth and didn't uh, manage to uh, uh, try to suck until you know uh, two or three hours afterwards. For the animals that died after birth, um, those numbers again were higher than those that did survive. So it is really telling that animals with higher lamb vigor are, have got a much better chance of surviving uh, a life, if you like. 
And in Ireland, they've brought in lamb vigor into the breeding program and they've differentiated the poor, very poor from the very good uh, lambs. And they're giving a, a five point score at birth from animals that are still not standing after 60 minutes to very good, which when they're standing within five minutes. And um, this graph shows the um, the prevalence of poor lamb vigor and the number of sires um, upon the vertical axis and each bar uh, uh, shows you, for example, in the far right one, there were um, a small number of sires where 65% of their offspring um, were had to be um, had poor, had the poorest scores one, two, um, or three, and um, uh, there were some sires where um, they had uh, very uh, well. There was some sires that had no um, re records of poor lamb vigor, and these aren't just sires that are used only in one flock. And perhaps you you, you could be forgiven for thinking that maybe they didn't record them. Um, the the animals had to be represented in at least two flocks to be able to be part of this. So um, that they are genuine uh, records. And we saw a much better heritability for lamb vigor, about 12 percent as a direct, uh, a, a direct estimate and a small element as being the maternal effect. So really much better than trying to uh, get the, uh, the direct lamb survival. On new mothering ability, they've done the same. So they've got very poor uh, lambing um, uh, mothering ability where ewes don't have any interest in their lambs for uh, on score one, uh, up, all the way up to very good where they're very protective. They lick the lamb immediately and follow the lambs very closely and, and, and complete for the lambs. So we, we, all, we all can identify lambs like that that we've come in contact with. And again, um, the uh, the prevalence of sires with um, daughters of poor mothering is very, very variable. So huge variation between the uh, number of sires uh, that require, uh, that, that have, you know, half their offspring with, with poor uh, uh, poor mothers and, um, uh, and some with very, very good ones. And that's, again, a, a decent number of flocks. And then the number of progeny uh, had to be over above a certain level as well. And there was about a 7% heritability for that. So, you know, not very big, but certainly um, decent enough to be able to include in a breeding program to avoid uh, picking the wrong uh, sires um, when you're deciding which ones to use to breed your replacements. And this graph here shows the um, the scores for, uh, um, for lamb vigor and mothering ability and the proportion of the uh, observations that fell into them. So most of them are good or very good, I have to say, with a, a, a few, um, you know, about 15% of the animals that are, don't score very well. And those are the ones you want to get rid of so that you uh, improve the population and the flocks uh, overall. And farmers did this um, at lambing time really simply with by having, Dan, Daniel mentioned, having a uh, you know, some kind of record keeping on 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 the pens in the in the lambing shed, and um, it it was seen as not being a, a, an onerous task um, in in Ireland to, but for doing this, and it can be done electronically. So these these data, although it takes a little while to start up, it certainly does uh, help with um, uh, with the the identification of of breeds and strains that are better or worse than, than others. And some people say, "Oh well, I, I'm, I'm going to swap my uh, my my breed for a completely different breed." And and I suspect uh, that this graph um, might dispel some myths. These these are the uh, breeding values for lamb vigor for uh, six or seven different uh, breeds. And again, this is Irish data, and you can see that although there may be uh, variation um, within the breeds, or each each of the blocks are represent one one different breed, um, um, more or less the average is the same. So it's um, it's all about uh, selecting within uh, a breed or a strain that you that you want to keep um, because there is significant enough variation in order to improve your um, the, the lamb vigor within within the uh, within the flock. And likewise for mothering ability, a little bit 
different um, as you might expect and I'm not going to mention uh, any, any of the names but you can see for yourself um, the uh, the average scores for the different breeds and uh, if you want to uh, to to know what they are they're um, Belle Claire, Charolais, Lynn, Suffolk, Texel and Vondine. Okay so quickly moving on to animal disease characteristics as, as I start started out at the beginning talking about um, time spent managing the manifestation of disease certainly uh, that can be said for uh, for um, foot rot where a lot of time uh, you you need to spend um, when you have a problem with foot rot and Daniel mentioned keeping on top of it to to avoid the labor issue but it's also uh, got a genetic basis which I'll talk about um, worms dagging time spent dagging, and mastitis. So the three endemic diseases that we know take up a lot of time and stop you from enjoying life, um, are, 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 and they're, they're not pleasant uh, either. So uh, trying to reduce the time that you need to manage that disease is certainly uh, can be achieved through uh, breeding strategies. And why do we need to include disease traits in sheep breeding pro programs? Well, a, for the, for the obvious reason I, I just mentioned, but also because sometimes they can be antagonistically associated with some of the traits that you want to improve. So that the obvious example um, is, um, you know, uh, high lamb growth uh, needs high milk production in order to fuel that growth. And high milk production tends to uh, lead to use that would have higher prevalence of mastitis. But if you combine the two uh, into a breeding program, you can both select animals that do grow fast and also have lower levels of mastitis if that's recorded. And we did some work and I've, I gave a talk, I think this time last year, and showed this graph before. So apologies to those um, who've already seen it, probably multiple times, I suspect, but I find it quite interesting that um, when we looked at the average weight of lambs reared to eight weeks of ewes who had good versus very poor levels of mastitis. And that's represented by uh, something called the California mastitis test, which was done on a population of, this is about 4,000 ewes, I think in this, um, in there. And the worst score uh, each side of the other was four. And if an animal had really bad udder on both sides, um, the, the um, average weight of uh, the offspring was um, uh, 3.8 kilos less than animals that didn't have mastitis. And that was worth uh, at, a, at a relatively low uh, level per kilo, around six or seven quid per ewe. So there's quite a significant difference, both in terms of uh, weight and also income from having ewes with clinical mastitis uh, versus those that don't. And I mentioned that um, foot rot and mastitis are under genetic control. We've done quite a lot of work on this, but it's it's low to moderate, I think, is, is the safest description of it. And um, uh, it means that you, you have to record accurately and ensure that the, the data that you, the quality that you have is good in order to make sure that uh, we uh, are able to continue with um, breeding for animals for high performance, but also ensuring that we don't get a correlated uh, uh, decrease in um, in disease status within our within our flocks. Um, with parasites as well, um, Antonio Pacheco has finished his PhD and he did a lot of work on um, quantifying the genetic basis, not just to individual parasites. So we've got here on the graph a uh, fecal egg count for Strongyles, Nematodirus and Coccidiosis. That's represented by the top three uh, rows there in that table. Um, between nine and 17% for their um, live weight, 33%. And we also had the genetic basis to DAG score, which was just under 10%. So um, um, certainly including those traits or one or two of them in, in the breeding program is important. But I would like to say that um, the DAG score was not associated with the fecal egg count which means that if you are going to have a breeding program in order to clean up the back ends of your sheep and make sure that doesn't happen, you need to have DAG score 
alongside fecal egg count, because if you just have DAG score, that won't necessarily reduce your fecal egg counts. So does selection for worm burden work? I've just got a few minutes to show you. Um, we, we did a, an experiment over uh, about seven or eight years where we had three genetic lines of Scottish black place sheep that were roaming the Pentland Hills as one, her, one flock. Uh, they were split into three. So they were high performing, average performing, based on the selection index uh, that Signet was using at the time. And then we had a, a low fecal egg count line. And each line had uh, five separate families within the line. And cut a very long story short, and uh, seven years of selection later, this busy slide shows the three different lines. So C is the control, that's a, the average performing animals. F is the fecal egg count line. And this S is the select high performance line. And for the strong giles and the nematodirus and the DAG score, um, all of those three uh, traits related to um, uh, worm burden were better for the animals that have been selected to have low fecal egg counts. Um, and, um, and I think it's you know very safe to say that breeding for reduction in fecal egg count certainly works. And in the first in the first few years, you get quite a high response because if you're selecting animals um, uh, year on, year out, uh, you, you not only get the reduction of fecal egg count in your animals, but they're because they're shedding fewer worm burdens, you get a a, a, a reduced pasture burden as well. So it's a it's a win-win situation for sure. And I also want to just to say and to point out that if we are lucky enough to be able to include genomic information in our breeding programs, we can make a really significant improvement in the accuracy with which we're selecting animals for some of these really difficult and awkward traits to measure like disease, which vary over years and have a, typically have a relatively low heritability. And this graph looks a bit complicated, but essentially all it is is plotting breeding values, conventional breeding values, which are on the um, horizontal axis against the accuracy of the breeding values um, from genomic um, evaluation on the vertical axis. And it's um, a population of animals, which a portion of which have got both the genotype and the phenotype. So that's the records for, in this case, foot rot, as well as having a genomic uh, uh, information. And what it's showing that if you look along at the bottom of part of that arrow, the uh, under conventional uh, breeding values of 10% accuracy, um, if we use this genomic information, even if an animal doesn't have um, the record of, of, of foot rot, you can increase that accuracy up to 50%, which is a really significant in improvement in accuracy. So the benefit of genomics is uh, very, very powerful, particularly for some of these traits that I've been talking about. So just to finish then, um, the traits I've been considering are today are mostly her lowly heritable, but, but there's because there's quite a lot of heart variation in them, we're able to make progress, uh, significant pr progress. They're difficult to measure, but they're worth it. And um, as I've just mentioned, using genomic information would increase the accuracy, um, even when animals don't have the, the records themselves. But the, the caveat being that as long as they, they have to be part of a breeding program where uh, animals um, within that breeding program, some of them have got genomic information as well as that the record of the trait that you're interested in combined and that your flock is, is, is associated with that, what we call reference population. And the, the good thing is that um, on average, you can expect that improvements in these traits, lamb vigor, uh, uh, mothering ability, disease resistance, you, you can expect on average about one to 3% uh, progress per annum in each of those characteristics. And that's cumulative. So if you keep on breeding one, one year on to the next, you're likely to get a significant improvement in those traits. I'd also like, I'd like to thank um, the people that have contributed to this talk and the funders. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Joe. Again, a lot of food for thought there. Um, 
yeah, a huge amount of really, really good points. I started scribbling and I, I had to stop because I had too many notes. So I'll, need to, I'll need to listen back. <laughs> <laughs> what I found really interesting, though, was your your score of one to five. And as we approach lambing, it's something that's a quick and easy thing for people to implement. And it can be as high tech or low tech as people want to do it, can't it? Like it, it can involve EID or it can just be something as simple as the notes app on your phone or a WhatsApp group or something that mm -hmm. somewhere to capture that data. Um but it's amazing like you're saying it's one one to three percent um every year. But I guess when when you then if you start to score for, for feet, if you start to score for mastitis, if you start to score for lambing, that obviously the, the speed of um productivity increases as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the, those very simple scoring mechanisms, anybody can do it. And even if you're not um, breeding your own replacements, um, you can at least uh, have some idea w how the animals that that the you know that you've bred um, um, or that have, that you've bought in how how different they are compared you know according to the sire, for example. So you'd you'd know which which line not to breed from, perhaps, or or or, or you know not to buy in, whichever way you're 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 getting your replacements from. And the the one to five system that that you showed for, say the one for lambing time. That's that's the likes of um, um how easy birth was or. Um, just something that's that's really simple like that. How have you seen it um, implemented really well? Like, have you got any kind of quick tips for people of of best ways to bring it in? Um, so the um, the Lamingese breeding value is is now is 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 part of the standard signet um, breeding program, and um, if people want to find animals with good breeding values for those they can just search the database uh, for 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 those um uh in in Ireland they as as the, the the data that I showed or the the system I showed you with the 1 to 5 is uh, is what they're doing in Ireland and I think they're they're certainly um uh they can see that for the lamb survival um they have a different system over there where they rank them from one to five stars, depending on um, whether they're good, bad or indifferent. Um, and for lamb survival, I think the difference between a, a five star and a one star animal is about 0.92 lambs um, difference, uh, you know, uh, um, in, in terms of the number of lambs. So it's, it really is does make a difference. There's somebody just asking there, um, Joe, if we could just put that slide up again, the one that shows oh, yeah. the, the Irish mm -hmm. one to five, just so people can, can yeah. see it. I think there's there's a lot of information on the slides. It's sometimes difficult to take it take it all in and listen at the same time. So if we could yeah. Sorry. if we could uh, pull that up again, that would be really good for right. for folk to Let's see. Go back. And I guess for for Daniel's side of that. You'd, you'd spoken about um, a kind of three-stool approach of infrastructure technology and proactive management. Um, Joe has very much spoken about how how the kind of, um, how all three come into genetics there, hasn't yes. she? Yeah. And um, you, you really itemised how having the right infrastructure can help save the time, but technology side, um, it was actually a very small amount of time, wasn't it, for people recording data when you saw it compared to the likes of opening gates and such like? Yeah, for sure. But then they did look at, so one of those uh, reports from Kirkton, uh, not fact, it was the other one actually, it was the one with Irish and Norwegian data in there, um, found performance recording to be worth £6 a U. So really worthwhile doing, but adding about 10% more labour on what was quite high labour burden flocks. And actually that was worth about 0 0.18 hours per U. 10% doesn't sound bad, but then if you think about it, if you're already quite an efficient flock spending about two hours per U, if you added another 0.2, it's a bit more. So there's a time burden to it, but it's not, I think it's about having the right technology there, the right, the right system in place, I suppose. Um, and it's it's having the time as well that if if you record it that you give yourself the time to then interpret it as well, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I think if you're a commercial flock and you 
few terminal sire half your ewes, you don't need to tag those terminal sire lambs at birth. I think it's about trying to be a bit more pragmatic about it. And if you just buy in, I don't think I would tag any lambs at birth at all. You know, I think tagging lambs at birth is very much a closed flock stud breeder approach from, from my perspective anyway. Yeah. And just just to close off the evening, I'm going to I'm going to ask you both, and I've not prepped you here, um, for one one tip for everybody pre lambing, that that you think is the biggest saving of time at lambing, and I'm I'm going to just kick off just to give you guys a little minute to think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I I think communication is is a massive part of lambing time, and having having those systems that it's it's a board to say that the, there's a problem here or uh, this one's been twinned on. Having that simple board, the AIDS communication, that would be my top tip. Daniel, yourself. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, I'll go from one of the ones that I put in my presentation. I would probably say it's about having things prepared. It's about having sufficient of all the different bits of kit that you need and having things in place so that they're easy to find. You know, having a good tidy up before the day and um, that you start. And I think if you want a tip for preparation for next lambing, it's about picking a ram, you know, picking tops that are going to suit the system that you want to develop. And in the absence of a lot of EBVs for some of these sort of lambing trait types, although there is lambing easy EBVs coming in uh, with better accuracy now, I think it's about finding a ram breeder that is selecting their sheep in the system that you want to be in. So if you want an outdoor lambing flock, you need to find a stud breeder, even a terminal sire stud breeder, is doing that as well outdoors, making selection on those traits. Great tips. Joe, what about yourself? Well, Daniel did mention about the, the you know, prepare, preparation for next year it starts now sort of thing. Um, but I would say that um, making sure your ewes aren't too fat and that ha that has a big difference in terms of uh, the, the amount of um, uh, lambing difficulties that you might get from overfat use, and um, uh, they they also uh, have uh, are uh, yeah are not so uh, have don't have such higher le levels of survival um, of their offspring either. Excellent. Um, in contrast to that, a thin year is also. Um, oh yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, That's when I say overfat, I mean yeah, I mean overfat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for everybody for joining tonight. A huge amount of information again. Um, I know it's a lot to take in, so we have recorded this evening's webinar, and I will circulate the recording once we have got it onto YouTube. We've actually got them all the recordings listed on a playlist on YouTube, so I will circulate that uh, when when we are um, once we've got it edited. So again, thank you, folks, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Good night. Night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.